Thank you, everyone. Um, I know not everyone in here has been in the track so far and has heard some of the talks, but um, for those that have, kind of keep in mind all of the things that you've heard about API product management so far and uh, try to like apply that to the decisions that Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and other companies are making um, because adding that kind of like extra context of why they might be making some of these decisions uh, in their kind of API life cycle now that they're 5, 10, 15 years almost in uh, to some of this stuff uh, is kind of important just to understand why these changes are occurring. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm Tyler Singletary. I work for a company called Tagboard. I've been there since uh, uh, for about two years now. Um, I've been working in APIs and particularly social media APIs since 2010, um, both on the building them side and on the consuming them side. Most of what I'm talking about today is about um, kind of the product management experience of consuming social media APIs. Um, and a lot of us that consume social media APIs are also building our own APIs that repurpose that content in some way or create derivatives of it and then distribute that out or do some sort of action on top of that. Um, at Tagboard, I'm the SVP of product now. Originally, I came in to, to run platform and then found that it just didn't have the product management necessary to run a platform. So I took over product, um, and now it's kind of put whatever it is my job is now. Um, it's kind of become more of a COO role. Uh, so I'm a little bit further away from API management than I was previously. Um, I also consult for a company called Canvas. It's built on social, um, and then I advise some VCs and uh, uh, other little startups. And then um, I started this whole API journey thing working at Cloud. Um, I was their API evangelist, then became an API product manager, uh, then headed up all of the platform, um, and then we were acquired by a company called Lithium, and I became general manager of, of cloud within Lithium. Um, so, how is this related to the whole new API stack thing? Um, I think social APIs are particularly important so, here. You said it's finished. It's we just started. We just started doing this. Okay. Okay. I'll continue. Or, or I'm done. Uh, social APIs kind of introduced the average consumer to interconnected apps. Um, it was kind of the introduction of OAuth to them, to where like they understood that they were granting permission. Uh, to some application of something that came from another network. So it's really important in like the whole scheme of um, the journey of APIs in general. Um, they influence people's lives in non-obvious ways. So like, uh, as we've seen with some of the privacy scandals and things happening, it's like people didn't really understand everything that they were giving away. And it's going to continue to impact their lives in ways that they're not even sure. Even if you didn't grant access to an app, one of your friends probably did, in which case your data came with that. Um, and it's at the heart of those privacy scandals. Um, once upon a time, all of those early development books on APIs, and even like when, when Ruby on Rails was coming out, the hello world of using APIs was building a Twitter client. Um, so like almost every developer uh, of a certain age now came up building uh, on these APIs in some way. And, um, now that we're in 2018, even to use social APIs, it requires adopting like massive scalable service architectures to be able to store that data, serve that data, compute that data. The table stakes to even <coughs> using social APIs now are much higher than they ever were before. Um, so I think of social as uh, kind of an oil metaphor. You have these core materials. They could be your tweets, the users themselves, posts, snaps, whatever they are. Um, you need to deliver value to yourself as the API provider through revenue, user growth, press, whatever the metrics you are can find that. You have to deliver value to your ecosystem customers, so the people consuming your API. But really, what you're trying to do is deliver value to your core customer, and that's through that ecosystem partner. So, um, you know, and a social analytics app isn't meant to deliver value to the social media analytics app with your Facebook. The, the meaning is to deliver value to the person that's buying ads on Facebook platform. The whole reason why analytics exists on top of social networks is so that uh, the business that's buying those analytics will essentially take actions on the social network, which is probably going to be buying ads. 
And so in the oil metaphor, you have those core, ma core materials, and that's uh, essentially you start with your crude, which is the tweet text in some way. There's some surrounding uh, uh, materials that could also be considered crude. It could be the, the user object. It could be some of the other um, hidden tweet objects uh, and, and, and attributes. You've got derricks and drills, those software that makes the collection and storage of that data easier. You've got transit and transportation, the software that moves the data through the ecosystem in some way. You could think of uh, converting a basic REST API into a streaming API, or the scale necessary to create a streaming API that's delivering 5 million tweets a minute, or whatever the current number is for that sort of thing. Then really where a lot of the software is, is in the refining network and the byproducts and exhaust. Uh, the refining network combines <coughs> maybe, uh, data from different networks or data from different types of data sources, it filters it, packages it into new kind of products in some way. And some of those new products are byproducts. Um, an example of some of the byproducts might be um, just because a tweet was made, that tweet might be a crude core material, but when a retweet happens, you create a whole new edge, and that retweet is actually a byproduct that you could then package and resell in some way. So we're going to cover Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. I know it's not every social API, but we only have a few minutes, so I can't do everything. Uh, there's just this kind of graph of like the basic capabilities of any social API. You start with the user. You've got two kinds of users, really. You've got your consumer user and your business user, and then you have the platform. The consumer side is uh, really concerned with creating content and consuming content. They consume it, create it. The business side is also concerned with content, but it's consuming it, creating it, and creating a special kind of content that's ads, which will then get put before the consumer. And then on the platform side, you're trying to make sense of and create new value out of the user data, the content data, the business data, and then some of the other platform exhaust, uh, which might be uh, anonymized data, it might be data that's about like a, a higher level of what's going on, so maybe not individual tweets, it might be um, things like publishing the number of tweets per minute as an API. Just to apply this to one network, I'm not going to do this to all of them, but Twitter in general, we replace the pieces here with the actual pieces that Twitter does. So Twitter has tweets on the business side and on the consumer side. Uh, they also have Twitter ads. Um, they don't have any platform exhausts right now. Um, they have at user data, the tweet data itself, some business data there, ad performance data, <coughs> tweet engagement. Starting with Snapchat, because they're the newest contender here. So Snapchat has what's called Snapkit, and they've been very quiet about talking about this, but you can find it on GitHub, uh, you can find it on the Snapchat developer portal. Uh, Snapkit itself was a release of several different APIs, all kind of named and branded themselves. Uh, you've got Bitmoji Kit, which is for bringing Bitmoji stickers into apps, uh, tenders using that. Uh, you've got Login Kit, which Tender is also using, which is a secure temporary lo login with the Snap user object. Um, they've taken a very privacy first kind of uh, approach to the way they did this. They were able to sit back and watch Facebook fall over itself with some of the things that it did. Uh, and so they've tried to take the, the, especially in line with what their app does, uh, take a very privacy oriented point of view. We have Creative Kit, which allows uh, content creators, let's say, brands uh, and other applications to make stickers, to make lenses, rich content, filters, uh, the links to things that people share inside of there and contribute back into the platform for use. And then they have StoryKit, which is for pulling the public stories out of uh, Snapchat. And they're typically anonymized, so you don't see the user who posted the public story. You just see the location that was posted it in and the, the image or video that came from it and some of the metadata that would come around. Um, they're taking a very uh, closely managed uh, point of view here. You can't even get access to the documentation itself unless you've uh, been approved to be part of their program. <coughs> so um, it, the, the barrier to entry to even work with this has to be that you prove yourself as being an established uh, partner that could give them value uh, for being able to go through this. Um, they, strangely enough, adopted GraphQL. Uh, which you would think that they wouldn't do, given that um, Facebook and Instagram have stolen most of their ideas, but they went ahead and adopted the Facebook created now open source uh, tool for it. Um, you can see some documentation on GitHub. Uh, really, it ends up just being the GraphQL um, um, 
can't remember the word for it, header file, essentially, for story kit, and that's the only thing that's there. Twitter has this pyramid of sorts of the way that it offers its APIs. Um, what everyone tends to think about when they think of Twitter's APIs are the standard REST APIs that are free. Um, those are gradually getting chipped away in some way. They introduced this new system called the Premium APIs, which are a paid tier that's um, kind of a, a affordable uh, tier of their paid services, uh, limited mostly to just search and then some user actions. And then you have the Enterprise APIs, which were formerly GNIF, which was a company that they bought uh, probably about four years ago, I want to say, maybe five years ago. Uh, and those are premium price, premium performance. Uh, you could, the entire catalog of tweets going back and going forward are fully searchable. You set up a rules engine, you have to use an API just to issue those rules uh, and remove those rules, and then you have a big stream of tweets that come in that match those rules and get tagged around them. Um, back in 2012, uh, Twitter gave guidance on what they wanted their ecosystem to be working on and what they didn't want them to be working on. And they essentially said that, you know, Building social CRM is good. Media integrations, working for enterprise, good. Uh, building traditional Twitter client syndication, that could be a bad thing. Pretty sure they said don't do that. Um, and then social influence ranking, that was a little controversial at the time. Um, I worked for Cloud at the time, that's what we did. It was nice to be on, on uh, Quadrant. Uh, and then social analytics, which was good. Most of this stuff still lives on today as being encouraged things on their platform, but they gave that guidance really early on. This year, they uh, finally um, got rid of the site streams API, which was essentially what every custom Twitter client, third-party Twitter client was using in some way to deliver uh, tweets and user data to those clients. Um, so back in 2012, they said, don't do this, and finally it took them to 2018 until they actually shut it down. And quit people from doing that. Um, the premium API was introduced, I believe, this year. It might have been in the last year. Um, it's a month to month lower cost thing. I was saying the enterprise ones feature rich, has everything, but it requires long term contracts and um, multiple tens of thousands of dollars per month, if not more. Uh, and then there's also the ads API for creating ads, uh, getting ads analytics, and all of that sort of stuff. This year, they also introduced a mandatory app review, and this is a new you can see going through it, uh, and a new developer portal. Basically, Twitter's now said, you can't just create an app on the Twitter platform. You have to go through this review process to be able to continue to have that app uh, in any way. And some of this stuff is thematically going to be part of the same fallout that faced uh, Facebook and Instagram uh, in the face of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, Similarly, Instagram, they didn't actually publish this anywhere, but let's read between the lines of the things that Instagram has done. Um, they've essentially told us that analytics is something they don't want you to build, but they understand that it's high value. As a, as a tool builder, um, providing analytics to businesses is definitely a high value <coughs> thing, but Instagram no longer wants that really done. Uh, they don't want you to create Instagram clients. Uh, if you look and do a search for any Instagram URL or Instagram handle on Google, you'll see a smattering of like five to 12 dozen uh, uh, basically web-based Instagram clients that just steal Instagram data from Instagram and then put a new shell on it and call it their own site. And so one of the things they were trying to discourage was doing that. So when they introduced their new API, which I'll go into a little bit here, um, that was one of the things they were trying to discourage. Um, they're encouraging, but consider low value things like uh, discovery. So when you do a search and looking for um, different types of photos, um, they want that, but they don't see very much value in it, or they don't personally value it very much. Uh, and then they really value right now, and you can see by the list of APIs that make it in the Instagram Graph API, moderation and customer service. Those are really the things that they're looking to encourage right now. Um, most of it is business engagement that they're trying to do. So, the classic Instagram API was scheduled for deprecation on December 11th uh, this week. Uh, and it was originally scheduled for that sometime last year. But then Cambridge Analytica happened in April, and they immediately said that they were going to just shutter that whole API within one week, everything done, all the planning anyone had ever done off the table because they were leaking uh, so much uh, personal data 
quote unquote, out of there, that they had to shut it down immediately. Um, what that actually meant was that certain partners got to keep it, but anyone that wasn't part of the vetted partner programs was yanked off of it immediately. Um, there will still be some piece of that classic Instagram API available, but basically you could not look up a user anymore and get all of that user's posts. Um, all you can do now is do uh, uh, some basic user data off of it, like the number of posts that they have. Then they released the Instagram Graph API shortly thereafter. They had a little early version of it there, but even just in the last uh, month or two, they've been adding new features to that to make it a little bit more uh, in uh, uh, par parity with what was there before. So uh, now they just have hashtag search added to that last month with some intense privacy scrubbing. You don't get usernames. You don't get any sort of user data attached to it. You don't even get timestamps attached to it. So if you search for a hashtag, on that API, you won't know who the author is or um, essentially when it was posted or any sort of that data. Um, and most content really only applies to Instagram business accounts, which are tied to Facebook business pages. So now for you to even be able to pull any content from it, you can't pull a person's content anymore. You have to have only content from Instagram businesses and it required a whole new flow for everything. Um, and then they made massive changes to the rate limits, which I won't go into in detail, but um, you can get a whole lot less in there. Facebook's a very similar story. Uh, Cambridge Analytica led to a drastic immediate reduction in rate limits when that happened. Um, they got rid of an entire set of partner category APIs, which were on the advertising side. They did a complete overhaul of the app review and permission process, uh, which is completely required everywhere now. Uh, they scrubbed PII from a lot of the results. You can no longer uh, query user uh, post objects in any way. Um, they removed the public user post from the public media feed. The public media feed is essentially what um, uh, Google uses to be able to include Facebook things and search results and then also some of the uh, media partners like, like Tagboard and a few other companies use that to be able to pull in all content that was public and then make that searchable and discoverable for media. Um, and then they've added new features to the Facebook Live APIs including uh, being able to create visual polls on Facebook Live which is their um, their distribution channel now for live video, um, which watches somewhat based off of it as well. Um, so their focus really shifted to creating and bringing content into the platform, not out of it, which is understandable in the life cycle. Um, but it had far reaching implications beyond that. Like now we're going to see less access to content and user data, less access to that exhaust data, uh, like the actions taken on the platform, more robust and sensible app review systems. Um, GDPR, kind of like, I, I haven't even got to really talk about that yet, because Cambridge Analytica kind of like ruined that whole thing all at the same time to where all the things I've ever been complaining about for GDPR have been complaining about for Cambridge Analytica instead. Um, so like they, they did this kind of in the wrong uh, order to keep us uh, informed. Um, GDPR definitely will knock out some uses of social media data. Uh, Lithium, the company that bought Clout that I was previously at, actually shut down Clout because they just weren't willing to put up with what they would need to do to make it GDPR compliant. Um, the scrubbing of personal data from the responses is one piece of them implementing that. But to me, uh, the most confusing part of it is that the role of a data processor and the role of a data controller in the context of working in the social data ecosystem is very fuzzy. When, at, at what point do I go from being a data processor to being a data controller? Is it because I've pulled in this data from the social network which they have authorized me to have and then I create a derivative of it? Is my derivative now something that I'm a data controller for and therefore need a whole new set of solutions for? It's a very complicated set and it's probably only going to get solved through litigation. So a number of other products, I already said Cloud was retired from it. Um, all those dumb Instagram copycat sites should go away. Um, third party Twitter clients are gone. <coughs> Google Plus, even in the last two days, has had multiple privacy vulnerabilities and is shutting down entirely. LinkedIn remains kind of a contribute content only through the platform. platform now. They've shut down most all of the things that allow you to bring anything out of it. But that might change under Microsoft. How am I doing on time? Yeah, a couple more minutes. Cool. All right, we're going to run quick. Uh, talk about the ecosystem a little bit. Um, it's clear that building a replicative consumer experience is a no-no. Um, they don't want it. There's no reason why you should be doing that in 2018. We're far past just repeating what's already there and rebuilding the shell of what the social network is in any way. 
That said, Facebook this week, I think, removed the language from their cost forbidding you to recreate things that are already on the platform. So it's a very strange decision for them to make, but it might be because they're, um, they're maybe uh, going to have some anti-competitive legislation put against them or something like that. But either way, you still wouldn't do it because it doesn't make any sense to do it. Your fun side projects are probably no longer welcome at any of them. Um, social APIs are for businesses with scale now. Twitter API came out 12 years ago. Like It's past that. It's time for them to be able to grow up and uh, be their own thing um, and make money from it, which they do. It seems to be revenue for the uh, enterprise data business on that side is one of the fastest growing pieces of uh, revenue for Twitter overall. It costs a lot to build businesses to scale with social. The storage processing, data licensing, serving, all of that stuff costs lots and lots of money. And so, like, you really have to uh, be dedicated to it and have a good backing in order to be able to, um, to, to get to play in this market. Um, the areas to really focus on are probably going to be in discovery, as long as you're focusing on businesses being able to discover content. Engagement, as long as you're focusing on businesses being able to uh, enhance or optimize their engagement. Uh, analytics is still going to be very important, um, even though Instagram is uh, kind of like uh, uh, dissuading that Twitter is still fully open there. But consumers rarely need or pay for analytics, so it's not a very good business decision to make that for consumers. I should know. Uh, and Cloud, we called it consumer analytics, and it didn't make any sense to do it that way. And in content creation, there's still lots of room for creating cross-platform content, unique experiences, and uh, content for ads. And just some examples. Uh, so this is uh, this is Tagboard. We pull in all of this content from various social networks, including Twitter, Facebook, everything, um, and then we redisplay it on news broadcasts and at events and things like that. Uh, this is Canvas, they do a motion analysis, so they take all the tweets about a given TV show, analyze it, and find out at what moments people have the most emotional reaction to it, and what it was. So it would be things like, oh, they knew during Game of Thrones, uh, no spoilers, but if they knew that a certain character died, uh, they knew exactly how people felt about that character and could report it back to the TV networks. And the, the interesting thing about the way this works is that uh, Nielsen has a deal with Twitter where Nielsen redistributes uh, Twitter data after Nielsen applies its uh, uh, algorithm to determine whether any particular tweet is about a given show and about a given airing of the show. And then that gets passed on to another provider, and then that provider repackages it and does its analysis on it, and then they offer it through an API to another set of partners. So the chain of APIs are just growing and growing to where there's probably four or five parties involved in the chain as we move it through. And then another quick example is just Sprout Social. Um, for the things to focus on, they're focusing on content creation here. This is them setting up the schedule of content. You might see this in like a buffer or something like that. And then on the other side, they do customer service. So uh, for customer care, they have all the tweets coming in or direct messages that come into a given brand account. And then you're able to manage the response, uh, analyze the response, all those sort of things that you do with that. So the themes. Just real quick, uh, increased concerns with privacy, uh, concerns with abuse, bad actors, non-core ecosystem partners are being excised. Um, getting all content and data for a user is going away, but Twitter still allows that. Uh, the barriers to entry are very high now. Uh, and we have more specialized licensed content on the platforms, which is going to lead to even more regulation from the API providers, because uh, they don't necessarily own the content that's going to be passing through their platform anymore. As more and more live video is being pushed through, that's going to be created by the big, uh, the big content creator uh, rights holders, and they're not going to say, "Yes, let's go ahead and distribute this football game through your Twitter API to anyone that wants it." That's just not going to happen. So you're going to see even more of those things right. happening. More deprecations, no acceptance. Thank you. Okay. okay.